begun the recording. Okay, team, I will share my screen and we'll get started. All right, let me know whenever you guys can see my screen. I can see it. Okay, yeah. perfect. All right, team, today is going to be a lot of fun. I've been uh, planning this for quite a while, so I hope that this is going to go over really well. Today is going to be an exciting topic. Thank you for the introduction, Dave. We're going to be going over uh, about how to recreate a game mechanic, and specifically, I set my sights pretty high for Shovel Knight's Shovel. Um, which should be pretty interesting. This is supposed to be an interactive session. Yes, we're going to have a Q&A at the very end of today's session, but at any point in time, if you have questions or want to interject off your point of view, please, please interrupt me. I'm more than happy to, uh, to stop, pause, we'll have a discussion point, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what you wanted to bring up. So here is what's going to happen today. So first, we're going to introduce Shovel Knight. We're going to play through the game and kind of analyze the core mechanic together. Uh, and kind of identify how the shovel interacts with uh, game entities, things in the world. Uh, afterwards, we'll do a game demo in Unreal Engine 4. Uh, and then here as a group, we together will create an interaction uh, from the game, which will be exciting. And then at the very end, we'll have a, uh, an open Q&A, open discussion, things that you've seen, uh, recommendations you would make, you know, anything that you want, guys want to talk about, it'll be uh, up for discussion. So uh, what is Shovel Knight? By... Uh, who has played Shovel Knight here? Feel free to speak up. I've played it, but I'm not good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very bad at platformers. I'm pretty sure I own it, but I haven't played it. It's gotcha. in that category. <laughs> <laughs> it can uh, frequently like come out in like, Humble Bundles and that sort of stuff. It's available on Steam, uh, the Switch, and, as well as a number of other platforms. But basically, it's an 8-bit uh, platformer uh, where you play as the Shovel Knight here with his trusty shovel blade. And your objective is to defeat the Order of No Quarter, which is a bunch of different bosses uh, around the game world, and confront the evil Enchantress at the end of the game to save your beloved Shield Knight. It's a it's a true, it's a love story better than Twilight, I'll tell you what. Uh, so let's actually see what the Shovel Blade can do. Let's do a IRL game session. So here uh, I have prepared Shovel Knight. Uh, this is actually going to be live played here on my uh, on my Switch. This is actually me running and jumping. Man, pressure. Yep, so we won't go through the entire level. We'll just do the the important stuff. So here I am as Shovel Knight. I have uh, uh, my B button is the jump button, and then my A uh, button as well as my Y button are the, uh, the swipes here. So I can run around and use the shovel just in the air willy-nilly. And whenever I'm in the air, I can uh, also jump and hit sideways. And then finally, if I hold down as I uh, as I jump, you can see that I impose this like vertical stance where I'm actually attacking below me. So keep your eye on the uh, the level itself. There are a couple of interactable objects that we'll see. So we have a an enemy red beetle approaching us, dastardly deadly. We'll go ahead and uh, kick them out the way, of course. And then what can the shovel do if not dig? So we already have two interactions that we've identified here. The user can attack enemies with their shovel, as well as dig. So, you know, all the things that make sense for a, uh, a shovel. And whenever the user uh, bounces off of an enemy with the shovel, they actually pogo up and gain a little bit of extra height. So we'll go through here, we'll dig up a little bit more. This is just a small collection of what the user can do. There's also these yellow blocks over here, which you can uh, bounce off of to destroy. Or if you uh, prefer, you can do the same thing, just swipe at them and destroy them. Easy peasy. Oh. I was hoping for a, a flawless playthrough, but here we are. Okay. So that's like kind of the the basics of Shovel Knight in a, in a nutshell. There's a different uh, uh, levels of things that you can do with the, uh, the shovel as the game progresses. Um, you gain an, an expansive number of uh, options available to you, but so far, pretty rudimentary stuff. Once again, showing off the, the pogoing that you can use to escape and climb to uh, to new heights. There is one thing in particular that I do want to show off because we will be implementing it later. So I'm going to go ahead and progress just a little bit further uh, down the uh, down the level here. So uh, I have a question. I haven't played that much of it because I'm terrible at it, but do you get new abilities with the shovel as you progress throughout the game? 
So, yes, there are some armors that you can unlock that allows you to do different things with your shovel. So, for example, you can have, like, a, a charge attack. Um, so, right now, you can only, like, swing it once, and then uh, that is all you can do. But you can charge it up for, like, extra damage later on. And then there are other things that you unlock as well. So, we will not be, uh, we will not be creating the, uh, the dragon. But we can see here that there's still plenty of things that you can, like, play with and explore as Shovel Knight in this first introductory level. Any other questions while I'm getting to the part that I was hoping for us to implement later? So this will be the, uh, the last... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, sound like a tough crowd. Nope, it is all good. I'm just taking that everyone is a, uh, is a Shovel Knight expert up here. So we can see just now that there is also destroyable terrain, such like this. So there's uh, those cubes over here on the on the far right that you can destroy, but also right here, this uh, guy right here is uh, destructible. And we have these evil green blobby boys that try to uh, attack us as well. So we will be implementing these green blobs as a part of today's uh, COP. So that's as far as we need to take it in, uh, in Shovel Knight. I don't think everyone wants to see me go through and as much fun as it would be to uh, go all the way to the very end and uh, defeat the boss of this zone. That's not why we're here. <laughs> Uh, so, let me pull this aside and we'll t return back to the, the session at hand. Um, so, to recap, what can the uh, user do with their shovel? They can dig, they can dig some more, uh, and they can continue to dig. This seems to be a running theme uh, that the user has available to them. They can dig up all sorts of objects, they can attack them uh, opponents, and of course, they can explore their environment using this shovel. So this is just to name a handful of mechanics that exist in Shovel Knight today. And so the plan is to take what we've learned here and to implement this uh, in the game ourselves. So let's take it to Unreal. Um, let's open this guy up. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Cool. So I know the resemblance is uncanny. But uh, this is, in fact, not Shovel Knight. This is a level that I, I recreated part of level one of Shovel Knight here in the Unreal Engine and gave it my own little uh, spin. And we're going to, uh, to do a little uh, play test of this. I don't know. Oh, awesome. I feel like I'm looking at the game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Uh, hey. Is this your first uh, time building Unreal? Is this the first or second or so maybe my... 50th? My background in Unreal has really started whenever I joined the uh, the XR Lab. So everything that you've seen here is just within the time of me joining the XR Lab and uh, this presentation. Um, oh, all right. In fact, like the day or the the week after you issued me the challenge, I went in and started like um, pulling assets from itch.io, which is a quick aside, a great place to find like CC zero assets for like a prototype. Started putting this together. Perfect. Um, so let's just immediately jump in and play. So here is our, our boy Shovel Knight, uh, also known as, uh, Yellow Duck. Uh, that's the name that we've, uh, that I gave him. I was, I'll have a more in-depth reason for that later. But see, just like at the very beginning of Shovel Knight, we have a, a diggable object. So if I were to hit my dig button, we can see that I'm slowly chipping away at this object. And it, in fact, does sink into the ground, goes away. Um, we have the red beetles, as uh, indicated here by these moving red cubes so they pose a uh, a minor threat to us so what we can do is we can run up to them boop and attack them with our shovel sword or shovel blade same thing with this guy up here so you can see that like you know breaking it down to its rudimentary components uh shovel knight in 3d would be uh pretty uh pretty much the same nothing super uh super crazy going on i'll go ahead and skip ahead just a little bit further so you can see that there are three or two types of things that we've seen so far the red cubes, which uh, the player can attack, like basically the uh, the enemies of the of the world, the diggable spots, as well as these yellow cubes, which the user can you uh, can hit with their sword to uh, dismiss from the world. So uh, this is the the final bit of the level here. So we'll dig through all of these. Notice that the uh, the pogo uh, action that the shovel knight uh, does in the game is not uh, available here. We'll talk about why in just a little bit, uh, and then we'll clear out these last couple of. Uh, Bits. We'll make our way to the uh, the end of the level. Oh, there we go. We can do a shovel knight. There we go. And ta-da! We did it. Just like that. We've we've made shovel knight. 
<laughs> Absolutely incredible. This is it. Ship it. Ship it. Yep. <laughs> it's just that easy. It's that easy, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so before I continue, any questions uh, before I jump into the actual implementation? I think I have a question just off of my curiosity. How long did it take you to make this demo from learning, like starting up Unreal and learning it from scratch, like give or take, like maybe a couple hours? Uh, on and off, it took me a couple days. Couple days? Okay. Yeah. Uh, wow. Maybe Appreciate the effort. <laughs> yeah, this was. If I had to give like a hard number on it, my probably like three days worth of effort, but nothing. I was I was excited about it, so I was kind of doing it on my own time anyway. So okay, it's no well, big so deal. I just wanted to give uh, people some motivation that you know Alex hadn't ever worked in Unreal and he was able to create this just for you know this presentation to you know do a deep dive in a mechanic. So you don't need to be an expert in gaming to be able to build something up. You know. 100 percent agree 100 percent agree and in fact i chose unreal just because that's what the team was going to be using so i need to get familiar with it if you're more familiar with unreal that's an equally valid prototyping tool um any other questions or comments before we jump into implementation um how did you leave those gems behind <laughs> oh uh they I wasn't going for high score. I was go I was doing speedrun strats. Oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Word. Okay, so we'll take a a quick peek at the the behind the scenes stuff, um, and I'll say that the uh, there's you could have implemented this in a number of different ways. This is what I decided to come up with as a newcomer to Unreal. Uh, so let's jump in to the, like the core thing that drives a lot of this, and that's actually a, a collision box or a collision channel. So here I've defined a weapon collision channel. Um, I'm not sure if I can zoom in to see this, but uh, I've created a new channel specifically for the sword. That way you can be interact with elements in the world. So the, the diggable spot, the enemies, the box. Uh, and by default, I want everything to ignore this. I, I specifically want to set up and define the interactions. So... If it's not defined, you can safely ignore what the sword does to the rest of the environment. Um, and we'll take a look at our character here. So his name is Duck. Um, quick tangent here. I was exploring what it would take to reskin this skeletal mesh to use this other like duck skin that I found made by the uh, by the same creator on itch.io. And it just became a little bit too cumbersome for me. So I was like, ah, that's OK. I'll just settle for Yellow Man. So here we have the Simpsons. And we're going to look at their colliders. So this guy right here has uh, a mesh collider around the, his character. Um, just so that way, or a capsule collider around his character, excuse me. Uh, so that way he can walk around in the world, but it's uh, set to block everything. We, and we ignore our weapon over here. So this is just your general uh, collision. So that way they're interacting in the space. But the sword itself, if I uh, set that to be visible, has two hitboxes here. Uh, one out in front. And then what you could have done is attach this collider to the sword and then change the rotation of the sword. That way it attacks both in front and below. But for my purposes, just to make things super simple on myself, I set up a, uh, a below shovel collider, which does the exact same thing. It's, it is a weapon that can overlap with uh, destructible physics objects, world static, world dynamic things. And so if the user presses the F key, it attacks forward. If they press the G key, it attacks below, just to make things simple. Um, any questions? I have a I have a comment, or maybe not for you, but anybody else. Does anybody understand? Does everybody understand why he's doing this with the collisions? Does everybody understand the collision detection? If you don't, you know, speak up because we'll be happy to explain it. Absolutely, it's pretty important with gaming. <laughs> I don't know about that, um, but what is the purpose of a mesh? So the mesh itself is the object that appears in the world. So here we have our um, our handy dandy character. So this is the 3D model that exists in the world. So whenever I say a mesh, this is the 3D model. So I guess it would be accurate to say that this sword is a uh, as a static mesh. Here we see that the uh, we can even change it to be like a different type of sword. If you want to be like a red sword, for example, we can change up the uh, what it looks like in here. But 
Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. No worries. And there are some. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm sure this unreal, but there are some like what you can do in Unity is you can actually attach that collider to the mesh so that it's perfect with the mesh. Mm-hmm. But again, if you have colliders that are that intricate, it kind of slows down performance and it's not really needed. But meshes have a lot of information in them that you can use uh, not only by just displaying, you know, textures. Yeah. yeah. Physics collision. Go, the term mesh comes from the the idea that it looks kind of like a net when it's viewed in wireframe mode. It's kind of a 3D specific term. I could see. I, I think if people aren't familiar with 3D, the term mesh might seem like it's might have a different meaning. But yeah, it's just a 3D object, like you said. And that sword's going in him. <laughs> uh like i said if i had uh, more time i definitely would have attached this sword to a socket added animation sound effects all that sort of stuff but uh for the purposes of recreating the the core mechanic itself uh, i didn't think that it was uh, absolutely necessary but it would have been cool yeah um cool so that is the basics of our character we have a collider around the sword or around two different spots for them that says hey i am a weapon and I can trigger overlap events with these types of colliders, which is the that's the important part. So now we need we have to set up the weapon. We've set up its colliders. Now we need to define what all it can interact with. Right. So we'll start off with our most basic component, this handy dandy red cube. I've called him BP Red Block. You can imagine in your in your mind's eye that this is the red beetle that runs around and can damage you whenever you like run into it as as seen on uh, level one so this guy right here is just a pure static mesh Um, he really doesn't do anything except that he has specified some collision here so here he is a destructible object Um, really you could have gone with world dynamic or maybe even come up with a enemy object type just to make things even more fine-grained uh, and we can see here that he blocks everything in the world, but he can overlap with a weapon. So this is what's actually going to trigger events in, during our game while it's running. So if I were to go to our event graph, um, nothing else really needs to happen here. This is just a plain box. And whenever the sword overlaps with this actor, whenever the two meshes collide, I just destroy this box. It never existed. Um, so pretty simple stuff. I can go in and actually drag in my, uh, blueprints, my BP red box. I'll just drag him right there, pull him up, hit play. And just to demonstrate, oh, our sword is visible. That's okay. Boop. And it's gone. So the collision as what we were talking about before is what set up the, uh, I want to hide this. Not be seen initially. I believe that's a visibility toggle. There it is. Uh, so that's what's happening here whenever it overlaps. Easy peasy. So here is where my implementation may deviate depending on what platform you're on or the approach that you take. I decided to go with inheritance over composition whenever constructing my game objects. So that means that pretty much the other, all the other boxes that exist in uh, this game here actually extend our BP red block. So if I go, for example, to our BP yellow block, the ones that we're using to indicate those, uh, kind of those blocks that we saw in the game that were hindering Shovel Knight's progress through it. Uh, they were just kind of sitting there waiting to be interacted with. Uh, let's actually open that up and check them out. So this guy, we can see up here, up here the parent class is of type BP red block. And it really doesn't do anything. It's just a deviation of our uh, original parent class with a slightly different mesh. So it has the exact same behavior as the, the red block. It just looks different. Uh, another comparison to this, if you're familiar with games like World of Warcraft, uh, sometimes they will just reskin mobs and maybe adjust some and fine tune some combat numbers to make to add variety to like a zone in World of Warcraft. Uh, but that's really all that's happening under the hood. They're just maybe changing some properties and uh, giving it a, a fresh coat of paint. But it's essentially the exact same object. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing you did this so in case you made a change on the BP red block, it would also be assi- or applicable applied to all the yellow blocks? 
That is one of the benefits of inheritance, absolutely. So if for whatever reason I didn't want to outright destroy this actor, maybe I wanted to also add a score to some sort of tracker off of this. Um, I could do that as well, and then that would be applied to everything that extends my red block. Nice. Yeah. Um, and so let's look at an example that extends the red block, but does a, just a little bit more functionality here. So get rid of the red block and dig this guy out. We can see that this one over here is actually moving back and forth. Um, of course, in game, you wouldn't actually be able to uh, to saddle up on right. top of the beetle. <laughs> Uh, but let's take a, uh, a look at this guy. So here, it has that exact same parent class of BP red block. We don't need to specify the overlap event because that's already handled in the parent class. But what we do get is that in the in the event play function, we can set up a, uh, a move to some move to commands. So this is what's allowing it to move back and forth between uh, two defined locations. So this is a script that just moves it left, waits a little bit, moves it right a little bit, and then just does it all over and over and over and over again. It's like a, a little loop. Any questions? Happy to answer anything. How long did it take you to get used to visually coding like this? Uh, the more I do it, the more the more I enjoy it. One of the challenges of visual scripting like this are things that are math heavy. I feel like that's the part that I still struggle with a lot especially whenever you break apart a, uh, a vector, for example, manipulate particular attributes of it, and then recombine it into a, uh, into a vector, which is completely outside the realm of this project here. But right. doing a lot of math in visual blueprinting is a little bit tricky. So uh, you didn't write any code for this? Uh, all blueprints. All blueprints. I guess you could technically say that I wrote only... I didn't write any code, but I wrote a lot of blueprints. Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I want to try it out. I've just never, never had a chance to. Um, I ha I had a point. Oh, it's it's it ran into my head and then escaped me. I'll think I'll think about it. It'll, it'll come back to me later. Um. Oh, another. This never mind. I, f I remembered it. So very much the same way that you have prefabs in Unity, blueprints kind of offer that same uh, sort of benefit where you define all of the things that you want a actor to have, and then you can just place them in your level as you desire. So um, the blueprints and prefabs are reusable components that you can have uh, dis dispersed throughout your level. And because you know that they're all technically the same like code underneath, you can be very certain in the way that they are going to behave whenever the user interacts with them. So all of these like yellow cubes, these BP yellow blocks, I know that they're all going to act the same. Um, and I don't have to rewrite code over and over and over again for each individual block. So defining thing once in a blueprint and then reusing that throughout your level, that's the way to go. It's going to save you a lot of time. Um, and then the last one that I'll share here before we go into our joint coding session. Surprise, surprise, there's going to be a pop quiz after this uh, is the diggable. So here is our handy dandy. Uh, a diggable object, very similar to our um, Shovel Knight's little mound of dirt that he gets gems out of. Um, what that does in the game is that you can, over time, depending on the number of times that you dig it up, it will actually produce more and more gems. So here what we have is this one does not extend uh, the BP red block because it's, it has a different uh, function. It doesn't need to be destroyed, so we've decided to create its own uh, special class. So whenever you overlap with the shovel, um, once again, the shovel overlap is defined here in our collision. It's a world dynamic object that ignores everything except for the weapon. So we can be very confident. Oh, and I guess it also overlaps visibility and camera, but the camera is never going to be uh, on top of it. These could also be ignore. Um, so whenever it overlaps the, the weapon, we increment the number of times that we've uh, dug at this object. And each time we do it, we either... Uh, lower the object into the terrain to give it the appearance that it is being dug up. And then once we've done it three times, we just destroy the actor. Easy peasy. So that's how, that's the, the magic behind these handy dandy little mounds of dirt. Okay, team. So here is where I want your assistance. So if we imagine way back to the uh, the playthrough, 
there were these green uh, little slimes that ran up and attacked us. They were movable, but they also took two hits as opposed to just the regular one hit that the uh, that the beetle did. So together, what we're going to do is we're going to create the slime blueprint, and we're going to add that to our level and do some playtesting. You guys ready? Ready. Yeah. Okay. So what are some of the attributes of this slime? We know that it has hit points. It's a enemy, and it can move. Um, so we... We have a benefit of having the yellow one already that moves. I mean, is the yellow one that moves? No, the the red one. The red one moves. You're exactly right, Dave. So, red block motion is what we will uh, inherit from. Let's uh, select this guy. We'll name him BP Slime. And we'll open this guy up. And how did you access the parent class again? Uh, so whenever I created a new blueprint over here, uh, I can search for a specific class. So, okay. Yeah. And then also, I believe that there's a way to do it, um, in the class definition itself. So class settings up here, the parent class is defined as BP red block motion. So if you ever need to change that, you could do oh, that okay. up here. Awesome. Um, so before we touch any of the way that this looks, let's take a quick look at the scripts here. So. Uh, it, it's inheriting from BP red motion block, uh, so it's actually going to use that same construction script if one exists for it. And same thing with these uh, event overlap and event begin play. So we will come back to these. These are going to be important later. But for now, uh, our slime was green, not red. So uh, how would I change the uh, the color of this from red to green? That's I'll give you, you one. I'll give you a hint. It teals with the mesh. Help. Yeah, I'm not gonna help either. <laughs> um, I think so. If we click on it, will it open up the option? Aha! Uh -huh. for... Yes, indeed. Sam, am I allowed to answer this? No. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's allowed to answer. I'm leading indeed. this. Everyone's allowed to answer. So I'm assuming the uh, meshes, or not the meshes, but the materials, rather, where it ding, says ding, red, ding. is there a green option? In fact, there is. You get a nice. gold star today, friend. Awesome. <laughs> Boom. Look at that. Is that the color green you want? Yes. We have a green and we have a dark green. Ooh. That's like Ooh. turquoise. Yeah. Let's go yeah. with dark. Let's go with regular green. That's a beautiful color, so... Fun fact, unrelated to this uh, discussion here today, green is my favorite color, so that's why I, uh, I was in, inclined to do this today. Nice. So, um, let's think about what we've inherited. We already have the ability for the object to move back and forth uh, on the screen, so we don't have to worry about implementing that. The new feature and functionality that we're adding to this class is a hit points, right? So if it takes two hits to destroy, um, it looks like we're going to need to keep track of that number somewhere. So, any guesses as to how we would do that? So, I, I have a question. Um, all the blueprint code that you had in the red guy, do we get to see any of that here? Or is it just parent begin and then parent complete? Like, or do we get to... So like to I get to modify like certain aspects of it. I guess that doesn't work too much with inheritance. We'd have to override, right? You, that is a great question. So this guy right here is essentially a function call to the parents actor begin overlap as, and the same thing with this actor event begin play. So we get all the benefits of the parent class um, by calling that function. So we already have access to it. Oh, gotcha. So. I see the move, the move to, and the move to. So this would be moving like left, and then be moving right, correct? Exactly. And that's okay. all, in, this entire bit of code is encapsulated in this single event get, begin play here. I gotcha. So there wouldn't, I, we're not making it so that you move left and slash, and then move right and slash. We're doing move left, right, slash. Uh, we don't have to worry about the movement at all. What we're trying to do in this case is we're just trying to add hit points to this object. 
is going to take two hits to destroy. Oh, gotcha. Okay, never mind. They're not hitting us. We're hitting it. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> the the shovel is acting on this object. This object responds okay. to the weapon. Right. Okay, I got you. I was confused what we were doing for a second, but oh, I'm on no the problem. Same page now. Yep. Um. So. I'll give us a, a good starting point. So we can define a member variable over here in the left. So I'll say, let's have a, an integer that defines max hit points. And uh, this guy is going to be an integer. We'll define that. We'll change it from a Boolean to an int up here. And once we compile, we can set the default value to two hits. Cool, easy peasy. Uh, and if we want to track the current hit points, we can do the exact same thing here. So current hit points is another integer, and that's fine by me. So uh, one of the benefits of using uh, inheritance here is that I can call uh, parent begin play to begin that uh, that action loop, or I can uh, kind of do something beforehand before the uh, the parent gets all set up. So I'm going to break this line in between, and I want to set the current hit points to the maximum hit points as the game starts. So that way, like if I wanted to change the maximum hit points at any point in time, I know that the current hit points always matches the, the maximum number of hit points. Cool, cool, cool. So easy peasy. This guy, we've given him a max hit points of two. And whenever this runs, it's going to set current hit points from zero to two. Pretty cool. Um, so now what we need to do is we need to count the number of times we get hit, um, AKA decrease our current hit points all the way until zero. And that's going to add code is actually going to look very similar to this guy here, just uh, a little bit in reverse. So here we're incrementing the number of times it's been dug and then performing a switch on this. And we're just going to do a minus and then switch, right? Can you copy all that stuff and move it over or you uh -huh. have to recreate it all? Well, that's a great idea. So let's uh, copy this and we'll show off the limitations here. So I'm going to move these guys down just to keep them out of the way. I'm going to hit paste. So I do have access to I did count, though that's just like a variable that doesn't exist here. So we're going to change these um, a little bit, but we will keep part of this. So I want to Get my current hit points, subtract one from them, and then set my current hit points to this new value. And this needs to happen whenever the overlap occurs. So let's break these lines here. We're going to save you for later, friend. Oh, this guy. Keep things uh, nice and organized. So if we follow the this line here, so with the overlap occurs, we decrement the number of current hit points that the user has, uh, and then we're going to switch on the value. So here, because our maximum hit points can only be uh, two, one, or zero, we don't need these pins. I'm sorry, was there a question? Cool, no worries. Please, please interrupt me if there is. Um, so if the user hits uh, decrements the current hit points twice, uh, we want this actor to be destroyed. And luckily for us, this is actually happening in our grandparent class or, you know, a parent class. Because remember, this guy extends BP red motion block. BP red motion block extends BP red block. And if we just continue down this terrible naming convention, we eventually destroy our object here. Nice and simple. But... I would like to indicate to the user some way, somehow, that something has happened whenever they hit it for the first time to indicate, oh, I did damage to this object, right? So we set the, we changed the mesh color earlier uh, as a part of the declaration of this object. What if we changed it to a different color whenever they attack this object? Like the dark green. Ah. Yeah. Let's do that. So we'll grab our stack mesh, the stack mesh component. We will set material. Oh, duplicated the tag, no worries. So one interesting item, this is material at index uh, one, not zero. So we're gonna want to change this color here, element one. 
And I like your idea, Dave. We're going to change this from green to that teal dark green. Boom, boom, boom. Easy peasy, hook that up and compile, save, make sure everything plays nice. And so now, together with your help, let's actually test out and see if our slime block worked as expected. So see you later, Beetle. You were fun. Nice to know you. We've uh, upgraded to a new friend. So we've moved our blueprint into the level. We can see here that it has in fact inherited from the motion block. It is in fact moving back and forth. If I run up and uh, and smack it with my sword here, boop, it does change color. So our, our code is working. And if I come up and smack it again, it's gone. We did it. Yay. Go team. Really cool. Absolutely that incredible. Yeah. Uh, cool stuff. Mm. Um, was there anything else I wanted to do before switching over? No, I believe that was everything. So let's hop back over to this guy here. Um, so here are some of the key takeaways, uh, from today's session, or at least this is how I went about trying to recreate Shovel Knight's shovel in the Unreal, in Unreal Engine 4. So step number one. Identify what you want to replicate. I saw that that shovel blade and I was like, that's cool as heck. Let's try and recreate that. So afterwards, I closely examined how the shovel blade interacted with the play space. Everything that it could uh, interact with, all the different objects, the different animations that played. Um, there's a, a number of different things that we didn't capture in this small demo, but there's still plenty more to explore if you want to continue to, uh, this going down with this further. Uh Number three, start with simple interactions. You saw that we started with that, the red block, which literally did nothing other than just delete itself whenever the weapon and the block collided. So that's a great way for you to uh, start your prototyping process. Um, step four, decide how you want to set up these interactions. Um, so I decided for the purposes of our demo tier today that I would use inheritance to uh, bring forth all of the capabilities of a parent object down to uh, my child objects. So that way, as I'm growing my repertoire of available blueprints and components and capabilities that I can inherit and use all of the code that I've worked up to, uh, up to before, if that makes sense. Uh, with composition, you would instead have a empty blank object, and then you would give that class the attributes that it needs in order to function. So instead of inheriting from a parent class, you would say this component has two hit points and it moves and it flies as opposed to extending a, a parent class that has all of that capabilities. You would just give the properties to that class. Uh, and then finally, iterate, iterate, iterate. There's, I, this was uh, the most refined version of this presentation that I came up with. And, uh, don't be afraid to scrap things if they don't work. I'll, I'll say that as much. That is really it. Uh, anything else that you guys want to chit chat about? I can go back and talk more about anything that you guys want to talk about. That was awesome. Yeah, Thank that you. was great. Yeah, thanks for the demo. Absolutely. It's a really good example of, of inheritance and in Unreal and blueprinting and stuff like that, too. It was great to see. Thank you. It gives me, it gives me hope that I can go in and uh, do something in Unreal and not have a terrible time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm dreading it, but I need to just pull the Band-Aid and just do it. It's not as spooky as it seems. Yeah, I, there's definitely a steep like maybe just right when you open it because the interface and all that but once you get past a certain point it starts moving pretty fast mm -hmm. i like to focus on inheriting first composition though um alex could you uh throw the editor back up absolutely um just uh i wanted to touch on that a little bit if you create a new blueprint um you can do a actor component this guy right here Mm -hmm. And so that was a way, I was wondering if you were going to go that route with, say, your health system. So uh, components that are created like this, you know, if you're in your um, any of your blueprints, all of the uh, aesthetic mesh and everything else is effectively a component like this. 
So you could create all of your uh, health logic inside of this and then just slap it on actors that should have a, like a take damage event. So that's mm. another way to think about that, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I like that you put that thought into like what should be inherited, right? And, and how you should set those up. But it's, uh, I guess, for people who care about that level of like decision making, this is a, a, another tool to be aware of. Unreal's so, got a lot of them. <laughs> I, so explain to me the difference between a regular blueprint and this compo component blueprint then. Um, sure. So a component goes onto a actor. Um, as if you pop open like your yellow brick. Um, or yellow bricks. Which I, yeah, any of them. Um, basically anything over in the left there, that static mesh component is a component, right? And uh -huh. you see at the top, top left there is add component. Yeah. You can add more components to this blueprint. Um, and that, that new uh, actor component we made will be there. Oh, I gotcha. And so then it'll have all that logic. So if that had functions, you could call those functions on that component to trigger it, right? So the the um, begin overlap could instead trigger a function in that. So it's just another another way of doing it. <laughs> There's you, no right or wrong ways, right? Can yeah. you also create your own events? I see on the right it has events. Can you create your own custom events? You absolutely can. <laughs> Uh, so that's built straight into the uh, custom event, add custom event. So, oh, nice. Uh, so for example, and then you would do whatever code you want off of this custom event. Okay. And then you will also have event dispatchers, which is a form of communication between actors mm -hmm. and components as well. I see, yeah, because that's that's what I primarily do. I mean, even in um, just native iOS code, completion blocks, pretty much, or uh, dispatch events, uh, that kind of stuff. I, I like to do state-driven design instead of update-driven design. Yeah, I think there's a lot of merit to doing um, state-driven design over update-driven design. The less you can do, or the less you, work you have in your update function. Uh, the smoother your game's going to run. Right. And less bugs, I'm assuming, too. I, well, so. <laughs> different types of bugs, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest shifts when it comes to game development is thinking on that tick basis. Um, it's just it's a lot to factor that it's happening that many times per second or something like that. Yeah. You start putting function and update. Yeah. Do, do I get all actors of class in every frame? Oh my god! <laughs> yes. So that's the other aspect of that of this too is like uh, that take is more expensive in a blueprint until it's nativized. Um, so it'll run on a virtual machine in a blueprint until um, until you go to build it out, and then it puts it it makes it into unreadable nativized code, <laughs> unhuman readable anyway. Right. And I guess it's compiled down to like C plus plus, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So Which removes the overhead of the VM, but is, right. uh, you know. So you could write your own C++ code, though, if you wanted to. Yeah. And there, there's to. actually, <laughs> there's some really excellent tutorials by Epic on how to kind of master these things. So there's certain things that are best done in C++, some that are best done in Blueprint. And it's actually a really powerful workflow to use both. Things like assigning a mesh to that static mesh component, it's way easier to do that visually in Blueprint. Um, assigning colors, assigning your shaders, so much easier than trying to assign like specific asset IDs uh, on the C++ side. It, you know, you just get a quick drop down, boom, change the color, right? So you can be a lot faster as a Blueprint. And, and the Blueprints all inherit from a C++ base. Right. So... Kind of that that flexible workflow is spooky at first, but it's so powerful once you get used to it. Now this uh this encourages me to to try it. I'm excited. I I'm glad that I could light that fire under you, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, that uh concludes the uh, the demo today. Dave, is there anything else you want to uh, chit chat about? 
Um, no, I just want to thank everybody for joining. I know we're on Discord. It's a little different. Uh, we might have to keep on doing this in the future if we have any more presentations that require personal computers. So maybe we can get our own Discord, or if anybody has any ideas of what to do uh, with an a alternate chatting way that's not Teams, uh, ping me. Um, but next COP, uh, I think we'll do a presentation, not sure if it's going to be Unity-based or Unreal. But um, since you just did this last uh, game mechanic challenge, Alex, I'd like for you to challenge the next person and we'll give them a month to get something ready together. You can even challenge somebody. If someone's not comfortable, we can have two people, like a pairing, two people pair on a mechanic if that's something that people are interested in. So um, I don't know if you want to challenge someone right here right now or do you want to wait? Uh, oh. see who's in the chat or you know that is a uh, that is great i feel like the the way that i've done it in the past for android stuff has been uh it's been best to include two people that way they can collaborate and uh, coordinate schedules that way if one person's unavail unavailable to demo you know the other person can uh can be there so uh how about connor you got the uh, the gold star earlier today would you like to pair with perhaps gabe on a, on a game mechanic of your choice it doesn't need to be anywhere as in-depth as what i did here today mm -hmm. yeah that's cool awesome thank you for volunteering friend or being voluntold <laughs> <laughs> so let me double check the date so the next cop is not next week but the week after and that is august 12th so it won't be august 12th it will be August twenty sixth. Yep. So you guys get a whole month. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Gabe, I'm assuming is that. Uh, I guess I'm trying to figure out communication wise. Um, I guess Gabe Mercer is that is that for uh, on Duke as well. Wait, say again. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how I can how I can best reach you so we can we can collaborate. Oh, uh, yeah. It could be Discord or Teams or email. Okay. Way. And just at this point, yeah, I'm out all next week. So, yeah, I'm going to disappear for a week. But um, I don't know if that changes anything. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Is it, I was just looking up real quick. Is it Gabriel Mercer? Uh, yep, that's me. Okay, awesome. I'll shoot you a quick chat. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Great demo. That was more than what I expected. That is phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> you have definitely set the bar very high. So uh, let's hope we have some demos that are just as good uh, coming up. Fingers crossed for whenever I have to do it, that mine's going to be up to par. <laughs> I have no doubts that Connor and Gabe are just going to absolutely crush whatever I just did. So, <laughs> All right, guys. Well, uh, I will give you eight minutes back. So uh, go team. Yeah. Go team. Thanks, Alex. Great demo. Go team. Awesome, awesome demo, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.